Our protagonist, Ray Breslin, is living his best life as an inmate in a high-security federal prison. Colorado's finest institution, of course. Ray's day takes a turn when a fellow inmate, the neighborhood soothsayer, warns him about a looming threat named Jax. Apparently Jax is the talk of the cell block, ready to engage in fisticuffs with our dear Ray. The next day, Jax does his best to introduce Ray to the fine art of fisticuffs, only to discover that Ray is no pushover. Cue the surprise, folks. However, the rowdy tussle earns Ray a one-way ticket to the luxury suite of the prison, the isolation area. A cozy spot with no windows, just the essentials, a toilet and the omnipresent gaze of a security camera, because nothing says home like constant surveillance. Now, armed with only a Bible and an unyielding determination to escape monotony, Ray transforms his cramped space into a command center. He's practically an interior decorator, analyzing the prison layout like it's a poorly designed escape room. The high security zone, conveniently located next to the fire garage, becomes the focal point of his grand exit strategy. Ray's Sherlockian observation skills reveal that the prison, for some reason, is understaffed. Guards are scarce, probably on a smoke break, their sacred seven minutes of nicotine nirvana. Jackpot. Ray meticulously times their routine, like a convict with a Swiss watch. With the guards predictably puffing away, Ray takes a detour into the world of espionage. Armed with a thin layer of plastic cunningly acquired from his chocolate milk packaging, prison life's delicacy, he MacGyvers a plan. The plastic on the touchpad reveals the sacred digits of the passcode. Numbers in hand, Ray coordinates with his squad on the outside to create a ruckus. A perfectly timed distraction while the guards are playing firefighter. Talk about a cinematic symphony. With the grace of a cat burglar, Ray uses the passcode to waltz out of his cell, through the vent, and into the unguarded fire garage. His team outside sets a fire. Because why not? Ray hitchhikes on the fire brigade's bottom, blending in like a master of disguise. And voila, he's out. Ray, our escape artist extraordinaire, drives off into the sunset with his partners in crime, Abigail and Hush. But alas, the joyride is short-lived as Ray finds himself ditched at a lonely telephone booth, a rendezvous point with destiny, or in his case, the police. But fear not. Enter Lester Clark, the mystery man who magically appears to smooth-talk the guards into releasing Ray. A brief cozy chat with the prison head follows, revealing the jaw-dropping twist. Ray isn't a criminal. He's the genius behind Breslin Clark, a security firm testing prisons for their escape potential. Who would have thought? Ray, not a hardened criminal, just a businessman making an honest living testing the escape limits of the finest correctional facilities. Move over, Houdini. There's a new escape artist in town, and he's doing it for the corporate paycheck. Prison guards across the nation must be lining up to get his autograph and, of course, some valuable feedback on how to tighten those lax prison security measures. So, after his latest escapade, Ray takes a stroll to his office, which is probably more like a penthouse with escape artist extraordinaire engraved on the door. Abigail and Hush, his loyal sidekicks, are there, ready to pat him on the back for outsmarting yet another iron-barred paradise. Enter Lester, the business partner, scheduling a meeting with CIA operative Jessica Miller. Now, what could they possibly want from the man who turns maximum security prisons into child's play? Surprise, surprise. It's a top secret mission to test a new prison for disappeared persons. But, oh no, Ray can't know the real location. The catch? Millions of dollars. Sounds fishy, but when Lester says jump, Ray reluctantly asks, how high? To keep things spicy, they cook up a fake identity for Ray. Anthony Portos, the Spanish terrorist for hire. Classy. And just to make sure he doesn't wander off the beaten path, Abigail slaps a tracker on his arm. Protocol, you know? But alas, this seemingly foolproof plan takes an unexpected detour. Ray, the man of the hour, gets a one-way ticket to a surprise kidnapping and an impromptu drugging session. The tracker ripped right out, courtesy of his charming abductors. Next thing he knows, Ray wakes up in a glass cell, surrounded by a motley crew of fellow captivists. The highlight? Cameras galore, watching their every move like it's the hottest reality show in town. Enter Warden Hobbs, not to be confused with the promised Warden Marsh. Ray's already smelling something fishy, but before he can question the bait and switch, the warden conveniently ignores his get-out-of-jail-free evaluation code. Surprise! Ray's not a visitor, he's an inmate. While our fearless hero is busy navigating his glass cage, Abigail and Hush are playing a riveting game of where in the world is Ray Breslin. Back in the prison, the inmates are treated to a charming spectacle, 
guards in matching masks, freely doling out punishment to anyone they fancy. It's like a twisted masked ball, where the dancing involves fists meeting faces. Enter Emil, another inmate with a friendly warning. Don't die. And by the way, he's in here because someone wants some juicy details about his boss, Manheim. Ray smells a conspiracy. This is not just any prison, but a playground for the wealthy to torment their enemies. Plot twist. Ray plans a cozy investigation in the isolation area. So, he and Emil kick off a wrestling match. All for the thrill of a ticket to the isolation room. A tiny space that doubles as a substitute for a torture chamber. Because what's a prison without a little drama and suspense, right? Oh, welcome to the tropical paradise that is the prison isolation chamber where the heat is cranked up to levels that even a baked potato would find excessive. It's like a spa day. But instead of cucumbers on your eyes, you get blinding halogen lights to disorient and dehydrate you. Ah, the warden's idea of a relaxing retreat. As Ray and his newfound buddy Emil sizzle in this oven of misery, the warden, the puppet master of discomfort, enjoys the show through his high-tech surveillance setup. Because what's more entertaining than watching people sweat like they're in a sauna, Enter Dr. Kyrie, the prison's version of a sympathetic figure who drops by after a day of this roasting session. Ray, desperate for answers, tries to play 20 questions about their top secret location. But Dr. Kyrie seems to be on a vow of silence. After what feels like an eternity, our dynamic duo is released from the human barbecue. Ray, always the observant one, notices the riveting revelation that the cell floors are held together by good old steel rivets which are very weak as compared to aluminium revets. In a twist of fate, Emil, during his own quality time with the warden, decides to tease the guy a bit. The guards respond by force-feeding him a water pipe. A refreshing spa treatment, I presume. But, clever Emil manages to snag a piece of metal during this watery episode. Post-torture session, Emil wants the deets on Ray's grand escape plan in exchange for his little metal souvenir. Ray spills the beans. The prison is like the secret lair of a comic book villain, deep underground. The master plan, dismantle some bolts, head upward, and voila freedom. Emile, seeing a golden ticket to freedom, decides to play ball. They kick off their escape strategy by staging a brawl to earn a ticket back to the isolation chamber. Sneaky Ray then goes full handyman, popping rivets while dodging the watchful eye of Big Brother, the camera. Once the rivets are history, Ray orchestrates a distraction. Emile goes into a screaming frenzy. Ray blocks his camera with a paper ball innovation at its finest. And like a ninja, Ray slips into the vent and navigates his way outside. But, oops, he accidentally gives the chamber a makeover with a broken pipe, turning it into a makeshift pool. When Ray finally breaches the prison's exterior, he's greeted by the vast ocean surrounding a massive cargo ship. Was this a prison or a cruise gone wrong? Panic mode activated. Ray ninja flips back in before anyone spots him, utilizing the chaos caused by the flooding chambers. Meanwhile, in the land of concerned buddies, Abigail and Hush are playing detective. They corner Lester, demanding answers about Ray's sudden vanishing act. The check from Ray. Bounced. The woman who hired him? Incommunicado. But Lester, the picture of reassurance, brushes them off, insisting Ray is just doing his job. Well, isn't that comforting? Oh, the joys of working for a security firm. Maybe Ray's just taking an extended vacation in the Bermuda Triangle. Or perhaps he's testing the prison-like security of an all-you-can-eat buffet. Who knows? Ah, the mastermind Lester, the unsung hero of job satisfaction, decides to make a casual call to the prison warden. What's his request, you ask? Oh, just a small favor. Keep Ray in the prison forever. Because nothing says business success like imprisoning your co-founder. Lester's dreams of being the sole owner sparkle brighter than a disco ball at a 70s party. The oh-so-loyal employees Abigail and Hush refuse to throw in the towel. They're on a quest, a journey to find Ray, who's probably enjoying an extended vacation in the luxurious tomb. Spoiler alert, not exactly a resort. In the heart of the prison, Ray and his partner in crime, Emil, face a daunting task, decoding the guards' routine. The challenge? The guards all rock the same fabulous masks. But hey, after days of intense observation, they crack the code. Now, all they need is a GPS signal for their floating paradise. Ray, our ingenious escape artist, attempts to enlist the help of the prison doc, who's about as cooperative as a cat during a bath. Undeterred, Ray resorts to crafting a makeshift sextant out of a cardboard paper because, you know, who needs a Garmin when you've got cardboard? But wait, there's a catch. 
To make this cardboard contraption work, they need to reach the top deck. Enter Javed Afridi, the Muslim inmate, who suddenly becomes their ticket to the high life. Little do they know, Javed has a side gig. He's moonlighting as the warden's spy. In a brilliant stroke of strategy, Javed convinces the warden to let him worship in the open air. And voila! With the sextant in hand, he calculates their ship's latitude. They're floating somewhere in the Atlantic, chilling near Morocco. Not exactly a tropical vacation, but hey, it's something. Now Ray and Emil need a plan, and fast. Emil, the man with connections, pitches the idea of calling in a favor from his friend in Morocco. Ray, the smooth talker, convinces the prison doc to send an email to Emil's Morocco-bound friend. The message is out, and the cavalry is on its way. It's D-Day, and Afridi, the inside man, feeds the warden a juicy piece of fiction about a riot brewing in Block A. As planned, the warden sends his army of guards to the non-existent riot, leaving the Babylon area with just a skeleton crew. Chaos ensues, a full-blown riot kicks off, and our trio seizes the moment to sprint for the top deck. But alas, life's not a heist movie, and the warden pulls the ultimate party pooper move, a lockdown. Just when all hope seems lost, cue the cavalry. Emil's buddies swoop in with helicopters like true heroes. Oh, the classic ship shootout. Guards versus the not-so-merry band of escape artists. Afridi, our sacrificial lamb, takes a bullet and decides it's prime time to retire from the mortal coil. Ray, always the quick thinker, cooks up a genius plan. Cut the power in the control room. But wait, Afridi, in a fit of selflessness, tells Emil to ditch him like an outdated smartphone. Guards show up fashionably late to Afridi's party, and decide it's time for a deadly game of tag. Spoiler alert, Afridi loses. Meanwhile, Ray's playing hide-and-seek inside the ship, and instead of, you know, walking out like a normal person, he decides to take the scenic route, straight into the sea. Who needs doors when you can flush yourself out like the remnants of last night's questionable dinner? Emil, the airborne hero, faces a minor inconvenience, guards shooting at his helicopter. Casual Wednesday, right? Ray, however, finds himself in a watery pickle. Enter Emile's grand rescue plan. Helicopter ladder to the rescue. But of course, Ray can't resist adding a little spice. He decides to blow up the ship while he's at it. Talk about a dramatic exit. Our dynamic duo, Ray and Emile, soar away to safety, landing conveniently on the Moroccan coast. Surprise, Jessica, the mysterious job offerer, steps out of the car. Oh, and Emile. Turns out he's not just Emile, he's Mannheim. The man everyone thought was his boss. Twist level. Expert. Jessica reveals the secret. She needed Ray imprisoned to free her dear old dad. Turns out Daddy Mannheim was in a bit of a witness protection situation. And Lester, the oh-so-loyal business partner? Yeah, he's playing both sides of the fence. Cut to Ray and Abigail, the dynamic duo 2.0. They are talking about what they should do with Ray's buddy. Lester, after learning that Ray pulled a Houdini, decides it's time for a getaway. But our detective duo, Hush and Abigail, aren't letting him escape the plot. Cue the revenge montage. Lester finds himself in a car, having a not-so-friendly chat with Hush. And voila! He wakes up, still in the car, but oh dear Lester, you're not in Kansas anymore. Surprise! He's on a cargo ship, destination unknown. Looks like Ray took the wheel of karma and drove it straight into payback town.